France has made working from home mandatory for at least three days a week. Indoor events also have limits on attendance and people are banned from eating on long distance trains. But there will be no curfew for New Year's Eve. Could we ever follow suit and make working from home mandatory, Kerry? Do you think that we should do that? Absolutely not. The <laughs> I, idea. I kind of guessed you were going to say no, that. No, the, the idea is horrific. I mean, it's all very well if you're well off in a nice detached house and can pay for deliveries of everything. But for the majority of people, and especially people in a flat with kids, mm. it's a nightmare yep. and shocking and an outrageous authoritarian crackdown on our basic liberty. Esther, do you have a similar view? I, exactly the yeah. same view. I just think... <laughs> this is not what living with COVID looks like. Right. And you know where I stand on this, but where is the logic in not being able to eat on long train journeys? Surely that's when you should be able to eat. Uh, well, it's just disgusting, though, isn't it? Just watching people, <laughs> watch people eat the on The food train. might be. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, but how can you tell someone when to eat? That's, isn't that... like? Am I the only person that thinks that's insane? Well, I mean, it does seem like a, a strange addition to the to the regulations, but I, you know, I I suppose yeah. I can understand the point insofar as it. Well, is the view that if you're eating on a train, you won't be masked, yeah. and therefore, well, is that what I they're mean, saying? Anyway, but the whole work, uh, the working from home thing, I just I just think it's unenforceable. Okay, it's unenforceable because I said this last week as well. You will tie up the court with absolute crap. Someone could argue that their dog was ill and for their emotional stability, they had to work from home to be separated from the place where the dog was born. You could argue anything mm. for why you had to not work from home. What do you think, Benjamin? I mean, I, I don't think the courts would be tied up because I don't, I don't think they would deal with something like that. It would probably just be a straightforward fine, like if you, yeah, if you, can were, if you were speeding. But uh, what I tell the work from home is that it's kind of complicated because on the one hand, Kerry makes a really good point that, you know, as I mean... I now live in somewhere reasonably nice, but until pretty recently, as a young person working in a big city, uh, the idea of, of working from home, the flat I lived in at the start of this pandemic, was not a nice experience. Yeah. And so to have the choice is important. And a lot of young workers, you know, when you're learning your craft, to, to bounce off your colleagues and learn from them is hugely beneficial. But then on the other side, and I think this is, is the practical health consequence of why a lot of businesses continued in this country to choose to ask staff to work from home or to encourage it, is because obviously the reality is if someone has COVID and, and doesn't realise, hasn't yet picked up on it or is asymptomatic, well, the nature of going into the workplace is that they could then risk wiping out a whole, whole load of colleagues, which has a far more serious effect for, for businesses' functions. So, so, so is, is the point, therefore, that we should maybe go back to what Kerry was talking about earlier, which is individual responsibility? In other words, if you are sick, phone up and say, I'm, I'm sick and therefore I won't go into work today. Wouldn't that be the sensible solution? Absolutely. Or to take a lateral flow test. I don't have a huge problem with those. I've had hundreds of uh, youngsters all last year outside our centre mm. having to sit and take lateral flow tests. Yes, it's a pain in the neck, but you know what I mean. The problem was more with people getting pinged for no particular no reason. reason. I don't know why oh, they didn't well, delete Well, of course, people have del deleted that off the app. So yeah, that's yeah. Happening, and whole school it? years getting sent home because somebody was near somebody was near somebody who got pinged. I mean, the whole thing got ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. But I do think working from home is the state taking a step too far into our lives. And do you, Absolutely. do you think, Benjamin, can I come to you on this? Do you, do you think that what Kerry's saying about it depends on who you are and where you're living, is there a class element to this? Is there, yeah. is there a point that actually some of the more privileged, this doesn't affect the more privileged people as much? I mean, certainly, if, you live, if you're the boss and you live in a, a nice house, then life's a lot easier working from home than for many people that, that don't have that comfort. But I think there are a lot of practical reasons why businesses have put that in place. Because, you know, you don't want half your staff coming down with coronavirus mm. because that has a disruption. I think that's one of the reasons why testing makes a lot of sense. You know, I work for a newspaper, so it's, you know, hardly the, you know, being down a coal mine. But we go in and we get a COVID test, which is for free in the building uh, when we go into the office. And that's a way to manage the risk. Yes. Now, I think actually at this stage of the pandemic, that's something people could do. But I do think that a work from home order is a re perfectly reasonable request when you have over 100,000 cases a day. What about that, Esther, about this idea of, you know, why don't we just say people should test and then take, take the responsibility to go in or out? The thing is, like when Benjamin said, you know, you don't want your whole staff being wiped out, having... The, we're having this conversation about being asymptomatic, but we're also having a conversation about the whole, like, members of staff being wiped out. If you're asymptomatic... Like, having COVID doesn't mean you're going to be off work. It may mean you have to isolate, but you could still work if you could work from home, or you could just wear a mask. Or, having COVID doesn't necessarily mean you're in the, what, 5% of people that will be seriously ill with it. Yes. And obviously it depends on your age and the comorbidities and all of that. I don't want to 
do any... I just want to live life normally. I'm, I'm, I'm not open... And I know this sounds really horrible. I'm not open to any of this, right? If I have to test because there's, it's the policy at work, fine, then I'll either do that or just get a new job. But I, <laughs> I don't really want to look into a future where this is the norm. It's well, annoying. It, I mean, that's a very interesting point, isn't it? That the kind of precedence this sets, you know, exactly. for instance, if you're saying that the government can just send out a decree and say that people must work in this way when we decide... Benjamin, does that not concern you slightly? about Not necessarily about what's happening now, but what that does later on. That sets a precedent, doesn't it, that the government can encroach themselves into your life and your work? I mean, even now, they're, the not, they're, not, they're not forcing people to work from home because they, there's flexibility in there that if people think it's not safe or reasonable at home, then even now with the current work for home order, in England at least, uh, you can still go into the office. I mean, I'm intrigued by Esther's statistic that she just threw out there that only 5% of people with COVID are actually ill. I don't know where no, that comes from. seriously ill to the point where you have to be hospitalised. Right, that, that, that wasn't what you said. No, but um, that's that's the point I'm making. You said there were loads of people that are asymptomatic. Well, how do you factor that in? So if you're saying how many people are asymptomatic, let's just throw a statistic out there and say like half half people are asymptomatic. It's about a third. No, but I'm, it's just I'm not actually stating facts. I'm just giving them like a... But let's say it's, it's a third. Let's, what, what, OK, can... let's say it's a third, right? Yep. OK, if a third of people are asymptomatic, OK, um, what, what does the makeup of your staff look like? Are they relatively young and healthy? Are they the kind of people that will come down with it? Have they had it before? Do they have natural antibodies, which I know is your least favourite thing, you know? the human immune system, right? Does, no, but what does that actually look, that, look like on, on, on an actual ground level? Right? We're not talking models of statistics. What does it look like in, in an individual case-by-case -case basis? And this goes back to what Kerry was saying. Just leave it to individual responsibility because there's so many what-ifs with this magical virus. But right? individual you responsibility... You can't just keep locking down society. Well, that's not the question we're having at the moment. But look, the thing is, first of all, everyone is asymptomatic. At the most infectious is the evidence we have. And then when they get sick, uh, that tends to be once it's waned or maybe day four or five or six. And so the reason if you have... Uh, so many cases right now, why it makes sense to have people work from home is to avoid that spreading. But also, one of the reasons to test is to try and pick that up before people feel the consequences of it. And, you know, it's all well and good if, if you work among other young people to make the argument you do, though I still don't agree with it. But actually, why should places which have a much wider variety of ages, why should the 70-year-old in the office be put What happened to autonomy and personal well, autonomy? But you don't have autonomy. Actually, because, but you do have on, autonomy. Hang on, wait, it's your own body. Hang on, wait, Benjamin, can I just bring Kerry in here? Hang on, what about... For a while. I'll come back to you in a minute, Benjamin. Be Kerry... But, Benjamin, surely um, there is the poss... If we accept that Esther doesn't like it, I completely understand that. But if we have the capacity to take tests, if we like, just like you, able to hear the advice and know what's going on, and I don't accept that the vast majority of people aren't concerned about elderly people in their workplace or around them or their family, then we are capable of being trusted and making wise decisions. It seems to me that you don't think most people are able or capable or would do that. No, and I think that's you're very wrong on that. And I think it's counter to helping us get it into a better state. And, for example, doing what would, you know, sort Esther's situation out with a younger generation, having antibody tests. But, Benjamin, we haven't can, can I put that to you? Because I think, uh, you know, what Kerry is saying is here... Do, and it comes down to this, doesn't it? Do you trust the public to make their own decisions about their own safety? Well, first of all, on the testing point, I actually think that's a perfectly reasonable argument that uh, you should work in the office but you do a test beforehand in a situation like we're in right now. I have no disagreement with that. It, it's Esther that, that opposes testing, according to what she said earlier. But, the, of, course, you, you, of course, people can take responsibility for themselves. It's not really... In a way, it's, it's not about taking responsibility because the nature of this virus that we've learned the hard way in the last two years since it emerged is that if you don't know you have it, if, if I had it now and so I don't... So the answer is no. If, if, I, if I had it now and I don't, because I did a test before coming on the set, but let's say I did, I wouldn't know it, and then how are you... How am I taking responsibility for the fact that you could have then been infected? That's the problem. It's other people that get the consequence of your mistake. So in, in this worldview that you had, what was the point of the vaccine then? Because if, you, if you're saying you didn't know you had it, but then you passed it on to him, I'm assuming his individual responsibility, which I keep going back to, would have said, actually, I'm going to take the, the vaccine because I want to protect myself. So then how does that come back to you then? If he's taken the vaccine to protect himself and you accidentally gave it to him and he doesn't have symptoms, he's well, when you have... he doesn't suffer particularly heavily from it, do we, do, does the world stop because you feel so guilty that you gave it to him that now the whole, the whole of society must follow your worldview and just be tested, isolate, jump when the government says jump? Like, you know, how do we, how do we function?
action in this but world. But you oppose you, testing, don't you? I, I oppose living in a world where we cannot accept that COVID is a part of it and people should be able to do what they make decisions that they want about their ben, health. Benjamin, but you don't, ex ex don't accept living with COVID. Want, if, if, Let's not get no, into the, the rights and wrongs of testing, but can I, can I ask you, Benjamin, about this? Because this is something I'm, I'm genuinely confused about. Is if, as, as all of the news outlets and all the scientists are saying, this is a milder form uh, and it, the, the, the symptoms are typically like a, a mild cold, mm -hmm. uh, if that is the case then why can we not trust, and we go back to this personal responsibility mm. thing, why can we not trust those who are vulnerable, in vulnerable categories for whatever reason, their age or their health or whatever, to shield themselves while everyone else gets on with life? Because after all, if we do catch this, as, as all of us are probably will, yeah. it's not going to affect us much more than a cold. Why, why is that such a difficult proposition? Well, the fact that it's, it seems to be Kill less Brownie. severe is, is obviously very good news that we'd all welcome. Yeah, it's but important, the, isn't it? The, the truth is, that, and, and this is what the experts have said in the last week, is that it is uh, much less likely to lead to hospitalisation, but the sheer scale of numbers mean that in terms of the number of people in hospital, you actually, it looks very plausible that we'll end up in a bad situation. So because again, we spread. come back to the shield in the NHS issue. That's for you the fundamental... But, this, this, but this for me, but the answer I would put, which, you know, they're going to sort of be up in arms about is this is why you should have a lockdown for the unvaccinated. I don't think the rest of us should be facing the sorts of severe consequences that are possible okay. when it is the unvaccinated, the people who are most at risk. Do, do you not see the danger, and again we go out to, to, to a broader historical question, do you not see the danger of setting a precedent where you have a two-tiered society and people are discriminated against based on their medical history? It isn't discrimination. Discrimination is someone who's born a certain skin colour or sexuality, a factor that they can't change about themselves affecting their life experience. Someone that has made a choice to not get the two jabs or the three jabs has made that choice and those choices come with consequences. And there is no escaping the fact that about half of ICU beds have unvaccinated people. But you can discriminate for, for other reasons than, simple, than immutable characteristics. Of course you can. Well, hang so, so, I mean, you're, you're saying that they've made that choice and therefore there should be consequences. Mm. That sounds a little bit like coercion. Ben, well, you do <laughs> sound like an extraordinary... I'm sorry to say this, but you do sound extraordinarily authoritarian. First of all, you've said that we need to have these restrictive measures and working from at home. And in France, it is the law that you have to, to work from home. And it's been even worse in Spain and elsewhere, as we know. Uh, and we, we, it, here it's just advisory, thank goodness, at the moment, because I don't think people would swallow any more of it. But first of all, you've said that's because of the unknowns. You can't know if you're going to get it or not going to get it or the rest of it. And so, in other words, you've already said because of some unknowns about a disease, we can't be trusted to make sensible decisions when we're, we're advised in that way. So you don't trust the public. Now you're saying you can't trust and the people who are the spreaders are the unvaccinated. And they must be locked unvaccinated down. Unvaccinated people I don't agree with, and I've had many rows over this, but unvaccinated people are not stupid, evil spreaders. They have serious dis disagreements and worries about... It's a serious hang disagreement on. with well, the Well, they vaccine. do have serious um, long disagreements. Long-term effects that, that we you don't know You about. and a lot of other people who are pro-lockdown and want to make vaccines mandatory have failed to that. deal with. I didn't people say any of that. You did, actually. Benjamin didn't you say he wants he mandatory to vaccines. Ma uh, he mandatory. was saying that he... But you did say he that he wanted, wanted lockdown, lockdown, lockdown for the vaccines. Yeah, lock them up.